Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and there's two things I want to make sure that people don't forget about. One is Dr. Dre. You shouldn't forget about Dre. Two is the electrical element known as the JFET. Now, when it comes to field effect transistors, the MOSFET, the metal oxide semiconductor FET, is definitely dominant. JFETs are arguably out of style. JFETs used to be popular in hybrid FET bipolar integrated circuit design, but most modern IC design seems to be focused on MOSFETs. You'll see discrete JFETs used in PCB level designs, and they're really convenient current sources to use in the laboratory. I have a particular place in my heart for JFETs because out of all of these standard semiconductor devices, they're the ones that are spiritually the closest to vacuum tubes. You can check out the lectures in my guitar amplification and effects class to learn more about vacuum tubes if you're interested. But mostly I think a discussion of JFETs creates a natural transition between talking about BJTs and talking about MOSFETs. And some of the concepts that come up when talking about JFETs also apply to depletion mode MOSFETs, although depletion mode MOSFETs are not nearly as common as their enhancement mode counterparts. So later when we talk about MOSFETs, we'll mostly be talking about enhancement mode devices. So on the left, I've shown the typical symbol for an N-type, aka N-channel JFET. And on the right, I've shown the equivalent symbol for a P-type, aka P-channel JFET. Now, a JFET has a connection called the gate that is analogous to the base on a BJT. But the other two connections on the JFET and the most platonic form of a JFET are actually symmetric. This isn't like on a BJT where the collector is doped differently than the emitter. Now, put a pin in that, because I'm going to come back to this question of symmetry later. For an n-type JFET, whichever channel terminal is at the higher potential relative to the other is called the drain, and the other one is called the source. For the p-type, it goes the other direction. Whichever channel terminal has the higher voltage is called the source, and the other is called the drain. So the drain is analogous to the collector on a BJT and the source is analogous to the emitter, but in some circuits, what's the drain and what is the source may swap over the course of operation of the circuit. If you have a circuit where the source drain determination is consistent, it's typical to draw the drain at the top of the schematic for an n-type and the source at the top of the schematic for a p-type. It's also traditional to draw the gate closer to the source, although I'll only use that kind of notation if I need to. The arrows here represent PN junctions, and in standard JFET operation, you set up the voltages so that these diode junctions are reverse biased. And really, technically speaking, I guess you could say basically we need the PN junction to be not forward biased. So we'll say for that to hold, we need VGS to be less than or equal to zero for n-type, and VGS be bigger than equal to zero for p-type, so that these junctions are not forward biased. So under these conditions, we can assume that the gate current is negligible, so the drain currents equal the source currents. Now technically speaking, if you reverse bias a diode, you do get a current flow that's the reverse saturation current, but that's a very, very, very small number, so we'll just ignore that here. As is typical, I'll now describe JFET operation in terms of n-type JFETs, and then later we'll talk about the p-type JFET. So here's an expression for the drain current, which is the same as the source current, in a mode called saturation. The saturation mode of a FET is equivalent to the active mode of a BJT. A FET is characterized by three parameters. One of them is the pinch-off voltage, which I've labeled as VP. For an NFET, this pinch-off voltage is negative. On data sheets, you'll often see VP written as VGS off. Remember that for an NFET, the gate source voltage has to be less than zero. Since VP is negative, when you plug VP in here, the negative of VP and the negative sign here cancel, turning this into a positive number. And 
that positive number is being added to the negative number of VGS. And then we're squaring that. So a JFET has a square law characteristic instead of the exponential characteristic you get from the Ebersmol model of a BJT. Beta is a parameter that shows up in JFET SPICE models. And I want to emphasize that this beta is not the same thing as the beta of a BJT. And it's not in any way analogous to the beta of a BJT. It's a completely separate thing. Some textbooks will put a K here, or sometimes you'll see beta as something like K over 2. But I'm going to stick with this beta notation. Now, this expression here only holds for a gate to source voltage that's bigger than the pinch off voltage. And recall that the pinch off voltage is negative. If the gate source voltage is less than the pinch-off voltage, then we get zero current. Notice that I've used a greater than or equal sign and a less than or equal sign, because if we take this pinch-off voltage and plug it in for VGS, this goes away and we wind up with no current. So these two expressions are consistent with each other at the boundary point. Lambda is the channel length modulation parameter. It's analogous to 1 over VA, the early voltage, in bipolar junction transistors. It's a pretty small number, so it's a subtle effect. In fact, to make analysis easy, it's often taken to be zero, in which case this whole term goes away, and we get rid of any dependence on the drain voltage. Other than the condition required to be in saturation to begin with, which is that our drain source voltage is bigger than the difference between VGS and VP. And remember, VP is a negative number for an n-type JFET. Instead of the beta parameter, we can use this parameter IDSS, which is equal to beta times VP squared. And this is a parameter that you'll most likely see on a data sheet. Using this expression, we can rewrite the drain current like this. So if we take this beta VP squared and plug it in for IDSS, when we take this VP squared inside, we multiply everything through here by VP. So this VP goes away, and I wind up with a VP here, and I can swap the order because of the square. All right, enough equations. Let's look at some graphs. So here we're fixing the drain source voltage, and we're assuming that we're in saturation, and we're plotting the drain current as a function of the gate to source voltage. So we wind up with a graph that looks something like this. If we plug in zero for VGS, we just wind up with IDSS times this one plus lambda VDS. If we plug in VP for VGS, then we have one minus one, and this goes down to zero, and then we have the square function in between. When people make graphs like this, they often assume lambda is zero, so you just have IDSS here. So IDSS is the drain current that you would get for VGS equals zero, assuming that lambda was zero. So I'm going to compute some derivatives so we can perform small signal analyses. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the idea of a small signal analysis. If you're not, you should go back and check out my lectures on the topic relating to BJTs. The transconductance curve is the slope of this curve. So I'm going to take the derivative of the drain current with respect to VGS. And when I take the derivative, this 2 comes down in front. If I take the square root of the drain current, then I see I have a factor here, this VGS minus VP, which matches this factor here. So I can rewrite the derivative as square root of ID, which I see here. And then I have a 2 in front. But I see that I have a beta and this 1 plus lambda VDS. But I only have a square root of that. So to get everything to match up, I need to add a square root of beta here and a square root of 1 minus lambda VDS here. So you can pause here and take a second and make sure the algebra works out. So we'll define the transconductance GM as being this derivative evaluated at a particular operating point. So we plug in the DC bias values for our current ID and VDS. So we just basically turn those into things with capital letters according to our usual notation. This expression is a bit cumbersome in practice, 
So quite often, this particular factor is neglected, and we just write this as 2 square root of beta times ID. Now remember that for a BJT, the transconductance was the collector current over the thermal voltage VT. So for a BJT, the transconductance is linear in the collector current, whereas for a JFET, it corresponds to the square root of the drain current. So here I'm plotting the drain current as a function of the drain to source voltage, and I have different curves corresponding to different gate to source voltages. Remember VGS has to be zero or less, so the curves can only go down from here. Now these expressions that I have up here are only valid for the saturation where the drain to source voltage is bigger than VGS minus VP, and the line corresponding to that boundary is the dotted line here. I didn't give the equations for the triode region over here. This is also called the ohmic region because they're not really relevant to the circuits we'll be looking at here. But this triode region is very useful for making FETs act like approximate voltage-controlled resistors. My colleague Marshall Leach had a paper where he described using a JFET as a variable resistor in a resistor divider in a limiter compressor kind of circuit. And the same idea is used in the famous 1176 compressor by Universal Audio. I won't get into those kinds of circuits here. All the circuits we'll deal with in 3400 are going to act in the saturation region. Now I have toyed with the idea of doing a special topics class on pro audio recording circuits like microphone preamps, mixers, compressors, and equalizers. That would be similar in spirit to my analog circuits for music synthesis class and my guitar amplification and effects class. If there's interest in such a thing, leave a comment below. Let's think about this VGS equals zero line for a second. So if we think about the triode saturation region boundary, if we plug zero in for VGS, we can see that the boundary point here is at minus VP. And remember that VP is a negative number. So minus VP is a positive number. So here's where that boundary is. And as you keep lowering VGS, this boundary point keeps moving this way. And as you keep lowering VGS, you eventually get to the point where VGS equals the pinch-off voltage VP, and then you're way down here and you don't get any current. A quick note about the nomenclature. The term triode for this ohmic region here on the left, that derives from vacuum tubes. If you check out the appropriate lectures in my guitar amplification and effects class, you'll see that the curves here look like the entirety of the output characteristic curve of a triode tube. Now, a word of warning. The equivalent of the saturation region for a BJT was referred to as the active region. And although I like to refer to this region of the BJT as the ohmic region, most people will refer to it as the saturation region if you're talking about a BJT. So this word saturation is used for two different regions, depending on whether you're talking about BJTs or FETs. I'm tremendously frustrated by that. It's very confusing. You just have to learn to live with it. In the saturation region, the JFET acts like a current source. And if lambda were to equal to zero, then it would act like an ideal current source and these lines would be flat. But if lambda is not zero, they're not flat. The slope of these lines corresponds to a small signal parameter called the output conductance. So when I take the derivative of the drain current with respect to VDS, this is a fairly simple calculation. This is all a constant with respect to VDS. And then when I take the derivative of this stuff, I'm just left with a lambda. So let's divide both sides of this expression here by this one plus lambda VDS. So I can write something like this. And then all of this stuff here, this beta VGS minus VP squared, I can replace it with the stuff on the right here, the ID over 1 plus lambda VDS. Let me divide the numerator and the denominator by lambda, and now I'll define the output conductance G0 as being this expression evaluated at a particular operating point Q. So I'll substitute in the capital letter version of these quantities that represent our DC bias values. 
Now, we're not used to thinking about conductances. We're used to thinking about resistances. So I'll take the reciprocal of G naught to formulate R naught. And this expression here is quite analogous to what we found for BJTs, unlike the transconductance. If we take one over lambda and replace it with the early voltage VA, take VDS and replace it with VCE, the collector emitter voltage. If we take ID and replace it with IC, the collector current, then we get the small signal output resistance for a BJT. Okay, now I can write some small signal models. So we can think about a small perturbation of our drain current as being a small perturbation of our gate to source voltage times the appropriate derivative plus a small perturbation of our drain to source voltage times the appropriate derivative. And those derivatives are given by GM and G naught as specified according to these equations we found in the previous slides. Now this expression for the drain current looks like a Kirchhoff's current law equation. So we can write a circuit that has two branches. One has a resistance whose conductance is given by G naught and the other is this voltage-controlled current source. If you look in Marshall Leach's notes on the JFET on his website, he refers to the current created by the source as ID prime. So he can write the drain current like this as ID prime plus G naught times VDS. That may come in handy in another lecture. And he refers to the current flowing through this resistor as I naught. Now, we could also write an IS prime arrow here where is prime is equal to id prime. Now I wrote this in terms of a conductance. We can also express this in terms of a resistance. So we now have to divide by r naught here and here. And I'm giving the expression for r naught here. And this is the classical hybrid pi model for a BJT. By manipulating the hybrid pi model, I can create an alternative model called the T model. So let's define a resistance RS that is equal to one over GM. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this resistance RS in series with the current source. And I'm going to artificially attach the gate to this junction of the current source and the resistor. And I argue that these two circuits are equivalent. If I take a look at what the current flowing through here, IS prime is, well, that's just going to be given by Ohm's law as VGS divided by RS. Well, if we divide by RS, that's the same thing as multiplying by GM. So that would be equivalent to this expression here. So the current ID prime is equivalent to the current IS prime, and there's no current flowing through this gate connection. So everything is equivalent. Now, I think the hybrid pi model is a lot more intuitive in terms of matching the physics of what the JFET is doing, but this weird T model can sometimes make circuits easier to solve. So you can pick one or the other depending on your particular situation. So that was all expressed in terms of N-type JFETs. What about P-type JFETs? P-type JFETs are thin on the ground, but they do exist. So for this diode junction to be reverse biased, or more accurately, not forward biased, we need VGS bigger than or equal to zero. So that's different than what we had for the NFET. Also, the pinch-off voltage is a positive voltage instead of a negative voltage like we had for an NFET. Since the source voltage is now higher than the drain voltage, I've swapped the order of the D and the S on the drain to source voltage. So now we're writing things in terms of a source to drain voltage. However, I do think that the P-type JFET equations are more naturally expressed by keeping VGS as VGS instead of writing things as VSG. So that's different than what we did with NPNs where we had VBE for NPN and VEB for PNP. We're doing something different here. Notice that I swapped the direction of the inequalities on the if-then statements. So with a PFET, you start at VGS equals zero, and you wind up with a drain current of IDSS times one plus lambda VST. And as you increase the gate to source voltage, you start to decrease that drain current. And once you hit VP, and once you're past VP, 
you don't have any drain current urine cut off. The one other change we need to make is to swap the order of VGS and VP in this expression for checking to see that we're in saturation. And if you take these equations and redrive the small signal formulas, they look like what we had previously, except I have VSD instead of VDS. Now let's talk about symmetry. If I look at the data sheet for this device from Interfet, I notice that the channel connections are labeled S slash D, and it specifically says SD pins are interchangeable source drain connections. So they're explicitly telling us the channel connections are symmetric. In contrast, if I look at this JFE150, I see that they've tossed a whole bunch of diodes in here. So to operate this the way you want it to operate, the drain needs to be at a higher potential than the source so that these diodes are off. These are in here for protection. Now, check out this J308 data sheet. This indicates that one particular pin is the drain and another pin is a source. And if I scroll down here and look at the gate to drain and gate to source capacitances, they are different, which suggests to me that this isn't a symmetric configuration. Although it may be that the difference of the capacitances arises from just the voltages at the drain and the source being different, the data sheet isn't really clear on that. I might guess that you could swap the source and the drain in a lot of circuits. It may be that it doesn't work quite as well because of the different capacitances, although that may only really matter if you're at RF. It probably wouldn't matter for audio, but I'm also just guessing. If you have any thoughts on this symmetry issue, please leave a comment below. I should mention that my notation in this lecture differs a little bit from the notation used by Professor Leach. What I called beta, Professor Leach called beta naught, and he defined his own beta that was beta naught times this one plus channel length modulation parameter times VSD factor. The last thing I want to mention is that JFETs are often used as switches, where you switch between cutoff and the ohmic region. And I would recommend everyone check out this great article by the amazing R.G. Keen of Geofex, talking about the JFETs used as switches in BOSS and Ibanez pedals.